Hi everyone and welcome to today's webinar session. Uh, I hope you're all keeping well. Um, thanks for joining us today where we'll be discussing uh, the five reasons to accelerate your HR digital transformation. Uh, my name is Connor McGrath. I'm digital marketing assistant here at Flowforma and I'll be your host for today's session. Uh, so before we get started, uh, I have a few housekeeping tips for today's webinar. Uh, if you have any issues during the webinar, please email info at flowforma.com for assistance. Um, I should remind you uh, all that throughout this webinar, your lines will be muted, uh, but please use the Q&A function uh, to ask any questions you may have, and we'll hope to get them at the end of today's session in our Q&A. Um, so also note that today's uh, webinar is being recorded and uh, will be shared with you in the coming days, if there's anything you need to catch up on. Um, and we would also be really grateful if you could spend 30 seconds uh, to complete a very short survey at the end of today's broadcast. And it really helps us um, in collating information as to what you want to hear um, on these webinars. So if you could spend 30 seconds on that, that'd be great, please, and thank you. Okay, so uh, today I'm delighted to be joined by Jacinta Hennessy, who's Chief Product Strategist at Hubbub HR, and my flow former colleague, Paul Stone, who's Product Strategist here. Welcome, guys, and thanks for joining me today. Hi, Connor. Hi, Connor. Um, so with that, okay. I'm going to hand you over to Jacinta and Paul, and we're going to give you uh, some background about Hubbub HR and Flowforma. So Jacinta. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Connor. Uh, hi, I'm Jacinta Hennessy. I'm with Hubbub HR. We provide um, global HRS systems, including performance, compensation planning, succession, and through our partnership with Flowforma uh, Workflow, which we're going to be spending a fair bit of time speaking about today. Um, our global HRS is designed for maximum configurability and adaptability, so it can handle both your country, regional, local variances, and everything along the line. We have full API connectivity, so we can integrate with your payroll, um, your ATS, other ERPs or systems that you may have. Probably our, our highest priority is our personalized and highly attentive service. We truly believe in partnering with our clients and customers to really um, adapt the system to meet your specific needs. Uh, we're used uh, by clients across many countries in many languages, and we leverage the Microsoft stack. We integrate with Power BI, um, with Office 365, and we're hosted on Microsoft Azure. Over to you, Paul. And uh, my name is Paul Stone. I'm product strategist at Flowforma, uh, and I'm here to represent Flowforma, which is integrated now with uh, Hubbub, so that you can automate your processes related to all that data on employees and so on that you store in Hubbub. Now, Flowforma is a system that combines workflow, which is the execution of tasks in a sequence to achieve a business goal, and document generation and document management. So that can be documents associated with your workflow. And then also forms, that's all the data as well, which you can enter in on a form and then exchange, pass around between people and exchange them with Hubbub. And um, one of the advantages of Flowforma is that it's adaptable. You can modify processes so you can change uh, with your changing business needs. And um, it's very fast and easy to do that. And it's very intuitive and easy to adopt. And um, so you can adopt it whether you're working from a desktop or whether you're working on mobile devices and so on. Um, and the whole system is very easy to adopt and agile. And um, they're the key points, I guess, of, of Flowforma. A little bit about our company on the next slide, um, where we've been adopted by over 200,000 users throughout the world. Um, and our main message, I guess, with, with uh, Flowforma is that it's easy to configure and it's removing a dependency on IT. And so it's adding in workflow functionality into Hubbub, um, workflow functionality that you can modify yourselves. Excellent. Thank you, Paul. That's a wonderful introduction. We're excited uh, to join you today for today's webinar um, on what we think is an exciting topic of digital HR transformation. And I'm really delighted to partner with you today, Paul. It's great. It's great to be here. In, uh, in our research that we've done on digital HR transformation, we knew that 2020 would put the spotlight on this. But we were actually quite surprised by how so many of the industry experts, analysts and HR leaders are absolutely in agreement on its importance and are speaking to it with an increased level of urgency. Um, we know that 2020 has fundamentally changed the way we work and likely probably forever. Many of us work from home these days, if not all the time, then much of the time. And I'm sure probably even laptop designs over time will include better cameras and audio to support remote work. Because as we all know, it's never fun to set up your, your computers for Zoom meetings or online meetings of any type. 
Um, so thank you, Connor, for setting everything up today for us. We appreciate it. Um, to start today, I'd like to open with um, a quote from um, uh, uh, one of my favorite uh, HR analysts, Jason Averbrook. Um, he said, the future of work has smashed into this world of now. We have to start thinking about now in a completely different way than we have in the past. If we could move on to the next slide, please, Connor. Then Jason Averbrook said, um, one of my other, uh, well, uh, the same <laughs> HR analyst said that HR led digital transformation has never been more vital. And if you haven't revised your people strategy around digitization in 2020, that's a problem. So that's a bit of a wake up call for all of us. And what we'd like to do now is we'd like to just jump into a quick poll. Yep. Um, thanks for that, Jacinta. So I'm just going to put up a poll here on, on screen for you uh, for our audience today. And um, so that should be present on your. Uh, on your uh, screens just now. Um, so today's poll is, I mean, do you have, uh, or does your organization have a plan in place to close its uh, digital automation skill gap? Um, so you've got a few options there and I'll give you some time just to fill that out. Um, and we might close that then and we move on. Um, so I just see that there's plenty of responses coming in at the minute. So that's great to, it's great to see. And we really, really uh, value your feedback and it's always interesting to see what challenges that uh, our audience are facing as well. So I might just give you another uh, another 10 seconds on that and we can move back to Jacinta. So I'll close that in five, four, three, two, one. And we'll close that one up. Um, so thanks for your feedback. And I might just hand you back over to Jacinta now who's going to uh, continue on here. Lovely, thanks, Connor. And actually a really similar um, survey uh, asking similar questions. Um, found that 28% of respondents replied that their company had revised their digital people strategy, while 48% said they hadn't yet, but know they need to, and 15% said they had not acknowledged their people, that, that they had not, they didn't have a digital people strategy. So there's a lot of work to be done, and we look forward when uh, Connor has collated the results. I'm sure we'll get them out to you after today's session. And as we move forward into uh, today's webinar, um, we're going to be talking about what is a digital HR transformation. Um, another uh, great analyst, uh, Josh Bernson, said that everyone agreed that the multi-year digital transformation their company was doing was suddenly accelerated to a few weeks. Every system, tool, and enablement platform has to work now. And um, Paul and I have had many discussions on this topic to look at how we can best uh, address the heightened need for digital HR. Paul, you'll, you'll recall that recently we discussed not only the pre-return to work process, but also other processes. Um, a, a, a company we were speaking with had an excellent idea for a remote work request um, so that if uh, employees were working from different locations, perhaps from their home or from different countries, that they would know where those employees are working. So I think we have some wonderful ideas around that, Paul. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we're finding that so many companies are coming to us uh, needing to digitize very quickly um, and not just digitize processes that existed on paper and email chains, which, you know, paper doesn't really work for processes anymore. You can exchange pieces of paper with people working remotely. Um, but they were also have, having come up with new processes. That pre-return to work one was a, a perfect example of a, a situation where, which didn't really exist or wasn't very important in the past and suddenly it's front and center. Uh, and all of this has to be digitized and made accessible via people's laptops from their home desks and so on. It's really a very different world and the pressure to digitize has really increased a lot. Absolutely. It's really forcing us to reimagine how we use technology uh, to deliver to our customers differently and leveraging digitization to build more business resilience as well, which we're also going to talk about uh, today. Um, there was an interesting article by Delo Deloitte recently entitled 2020 Accelerating Digital HR During and Post COVID-19 and they wrote, now is the time to accelerate digital HR. The crisis has fundamentally changed the way we live and the way we work and offers the possibility for HR leaders to accelerate digital. Fa it's faster than everyone could imagine now and now is the time to think forward and embrace the true power of digital HR. And if we can just jump to the next slide, please, Connor. Um, so this is interesting. This was a, um, a survey recently uh, conducted by IBM entitled COVID-19 and the Future of Business. 
And they found that, as not surprisingly, that the pandemic has accelerated digital transformation at 59% of companies. But the thing that we found most um, interesting was that 66% of respondents say that they are now able to complete digital initiatives that previously might have encountered resistance. So that tells us that there's now an increasing interest in picking up the pace on some of these projects that may have been stalled or may not have been getting the attention they need. Paul, I'm sure you're hearing this from customers as well, that they're really ready to move forward with more of a sense of urgency now. Oh, very much so. Um, you know, when people are back at their desks and in, in their houses doing their work, they they just realize how dependent they were on that social interaction, that you know, that ability just to just turn their head and speak to their colleague. And it just isn't there anymore. Uh, and they they really realize that and they understand now that they've got to digitize. So suddenly where they might have resisted it in the past as, oh, it's too much change, too much hassle, you know, it's too difficult. Suddenly they're saying, well, it's not, you know, we have to make this work. We've got to go digital. We have to digitize our processes um, because we we can't be productive without some some digital process, some digital way to 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 pass work between each other. You know, it's it's just it's very difficult. And um, so it's given people a new sense of urgency. They really realize the challenge and are very much up to the challenge based on the uh, you know the calls that we've had with with many clients. So Definitely yeah, absolutely. Job. Yep, we're, we're finding the same, Paul. And Connor, if we jump to the next uh, slide, uh, we can just um, cover off. Yep, exactly. So these are basically the five areas that um, Paul and I have, have broken down today's webinar into. We're calling them the five reasons. Uh, firstly, that remote work is here to stay, looking at how we can leverage digital HR processes to support this new world of work, returning to work, working from home, everything in between. And Paul, you're going to share a few examples of that with us later on. And then we're also going to talk about the balance between global visibility, information flow, and how to look at adapting um, your technology for both the global and local requirements, um, which has become apparent, and, and we'll speak about that a little bit later. We're going to speak also about using the data for um, to facilitate decision making, which can actually help in building business resilience. And uh, one of our favorite topics, uh, we're going to speak to engagement and the employee experience, and we're going to uh, explore the concept of employee journeys. And then fifth and foremost, we are going to discuss business continuity. And Paul is going to take you on a bit of a tour of a really interesting process that will support business continuity, right, Paul? Absolutely, yeah, the construction of a continuity plan. So I'll detail that uh, during our demonstration later. Sounds fantastic. Looking forward to that. And if we jump to the next slide, please, Connor. We will jump into reason number one. Remote work is here to stay, uh, leveraging digital processes. Um, so Josh Brunson noted, if there's anything we've learned from the pandemic, it's that in today's world, we need systems that can adapt, morph, and change to meet our new needs. Agility is everything in business today. We cannot predict precisely what jobs people will be in, what location or travel policies we will have every week, but we do need to implement all of these processes and we need a tool set that can adapt to these needs. In the research we've done, it's very clear that remote work is here to stay. And while it might go back and forth in terms of being in the office, not being in the office or some type of hybrid, some people are even talking about virtual offices now. Um, where they might be pseudo permanently um, not going into the office. But we did a quick search and looked at some of the companies to see uh, what their policies might, might be. And we found that Google has now instituted a hybrid work from home model. They're indicating they will allow all workers to work from home until at least mid next year. Uh, Twitter has taken it a step further. They're saying that employees don't ever have to go back into the office unless they want to. And if employees want to work from home, they'll let them do it forever. Um, Siemens, uh, a large company with 140,000 employees globally, are allowing people to work permanently from home for two or three days a week if they wish. Um, Microsoft will let employees work from home permanently if employees request it. And they've taken it a step further that for those that want to work remotely, whose jobs can be done remotely, they will even have the option to relocate even internationally if approved. And then there's lots of other companies like Aetna, Capital One, Gartner, MasterCard. They're allowing work from home for the remainder of the year and well into next year. So as we can see, and as I think we all know, uh, remote work and different working arrangements are here to stay. And many companies are going to support it. 
um, definitely through into next year and in some cases permanently. So now we're looking at the digital transformation projects that are needed to support this new way of working. And um, Paul, I would imagine that a lot of your colleagues are working from home these days. Oh yes, absolutely. Myself and Connor made a special exception getting into the office today just for our, our webinar. But uh, but normally we'd be working from home and indeed the entire company is working from home and working from home very successfully because um, we've, we've enabled people with the tools to be able to access, to be able to communicate with each other and the tools to be able to execute processes and so on. Uh, and we're actually um, working very well actually from home. So it can work. Um, it just takes a little bit of change in terms of procedures and so on to be able to, to make that happen. Yeah, absolutely. And 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 we're 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 seeing there's so many studies out there that are indicating how people are working from home successfully and how they're achieving a, a different work-life balance. So it's an interesting time we're in right now. And in the next slide, um, we're referring to a digital transformation survey. Uh, this was done by the Boston Consulting Group and Ipsos. Uh, they conducted a survey of over 5,000 managers across Europe, the US and China, just to see where they sit uh, with the idea of digital transformation. As we can see, um, over 89% 80, of managers feel involved in digital transformation at their company, a little bit lower for employees. But when we move to those that believe a digital transformation will help companies relaunch activities more easily, once the crisis is over, both employees and managers are well over 80%. So I think people are seeing the move to digital transformation as a very optimistic move forward to help find our way out and back into some type of semblance of normality. Um, it also shows that both managers and employees, over 80%, want and are willing to participate in the digital transformation. So that's really encouraging for us as HR leaders to know that if we do embark on this, the statistics are showing us that there will be an engagement and a level of interest in this. The only one that was a little bit lower at 50% was that employees aren't quite sure yet how it will or will not benefit their jobs. And I think that's just because this is a relatively new idea. And over time, hopefully we will see that number increase. So now we can jump on to reason number two, looking at global visibility and information flow. Um, IBM recently uh, remarked in an article entitled COVID-19 and the Future of Business, adaptability is now a mandatory business competency and an accelerated change of pace has become the normal. So we want to talk a little bit about this and um, a, a personal story sort of comes to mind here. I hope you will indulge me for a moment. Um, back in the day when I worked with uh, my former company, we had about 14,000 employees. We operated on different continents across the globe. And uh, we embarked on a pretty ambitious project to implement a global ERP, one of the leading ERPs, but it required that we had pretty solid standardized processes in place. Um, we were nowhere near having standard processes in place. So at that time, I naively took on the project to lead both um, for HR, to lead both the um, ERP implementation with a concurrent global process review. Well, I think you can imagine how that went. Um, it was an eye-opening experience when we worked with our stakeholders across the globe. We were so focused on trying to come to some type of standardization. In the process, we were losing sight of the fact that we were a truly global company and we had global needs, corporate needs, and really valid local needs. Um, and trying to morph those needs and fit them into some type of global standard was just becoming increasingly difficult. Um, it was becoming evident that the approach we were taking was just too rigid and there had to be a way to allow for variances to support the needs of all the constituents. Um, it was becoming apparent to us that a global HRIS needed to be configurable and adaptable to navigate all of these different needs with global, local and community stakeholders. So we set about designing an HR system that could do just that creating adaptable and configurable HR software. And we'll also see uh, when Paul walks us through the processes, how truly configurable and adaptable uh, the workflow is as well. And if we jump over to uh, reason number three there, Connor, please. So now we're discussing the relevance of real-time data and its role to facilitate decision-making. Uh, McKinsey recently noted that never before has the need for accurate and timely data been greater. The disruptions of the coronavirus have underscored the crucial role of technology, 
from supporting remote working, as we talked about, to scaling digital channels. More importantly, they've highlighted a point that has been made but made before but can no longer be ignored. Technology is a core driver of value and not merely a support function. This was interesting because I was speaking with a customer just the other day um, that was reflecting on the last year, few months, and um, what it meant to have a global HR system in place and how it had been pivotal to them during this time. Um, she specifically mentioned that having immediate access into their data for all of their operations and business units helped them to make some um, collective decisions on how to move forward. And it's kind of funny because when they first started their implementation project several years ago, her team felt they, there was a little bit of grumbling. They felt that getting their data in order felt somewhat boring, maybe administrative kind of back office work. But now that they have it in a system and it's accessible and they can um, analyze it and report on it, they realize just how important it is during times like this. And um, it also helped me recall another instance um, in my previous position when I was sort of going about um, meeting with different people at our operations as part of that process review and um, ERP implementation. I remember when I'd visit with our various uh, global and regional stakeholders, they used to tell me, oh my goodness, all the reports from corporate to submit these monthly reports, periodic reports of how many people we have and, and this, that, and the other thing, it's, it's just exhausting and we just want to go about doing our jobs. And one of the biggest popularity points um, at that particular point was, well, if we had this global system that was globally accessible and your data was in there, corporate wouldn't have to ask you those things anymore. And they said, okay, where can we sign up? Because that would be, that would be a great benefit to us if we didn't have to spend our time on that. Um, and if we jump to the next slide, please, Connor. Um, IBM actually calls this um, HR 3.0. So whether we call it 3.0 or not, they're basically saying that we need to accelerate this journey. Uh, they're saying that by moving HR systems to a cloud environment, leaders get the scalability and flexibility to make evidence-based decisions, which is important, that correlate with their long-term strategy, as well as deploy consistent global self-service HR tools that improve the employee experience. And that's really the crux of what we're talking about today. Um, Paul, what we're hearing from customers is that they almost have to do digital HR transformation now. It's like the events of this year have given companies permission to sort of embrace technologies that might not have been a high priority in the past. Are, are you finding that as well? Yeah, absolutely. Everything's accelerated. Uh, but it's an interesting point that IBM are making about that transfer to the cloud, because you have to make those systems accessible to everybody in their remote locations. And, and doing that with old on-premise systems is, is very difficult. So really going, moving to the cloud makes so much sense now. Uh, and we're certainly seeing an acceleration of our, our own client base from uh, on-premise, old on-premise systems into the cloud at this point. Uh, and I'm sure that's driven by, uh, by the current COVID situation. Yes, absolutely. And it makes it so much easier because with on-premise, you have to look at VPNs and all the things that go along with that. Whereas with cloud, um, you have that access level that you need. Excellent point, Paul. Yeah. And if we look at the next, um, the next slide, th this goes back to um, that survey that we talked about earlier. It's just another statistic from the, um, the survey done with the Boston Consulting Group and Ipsos. Again, it's the Digital Transformation Survey, where they talk to over 5,000 um, different stakeholders. So the interesting point here is that um, they asked uh, managers, would they be interested in using these new digitized, digitized methods, shall we say, or this digitized way of working? And a very large percentage, as we can see, 83% said yes. And then they went on to further ask managers, well, do you think your employees would also do the same? And again, 82% said, said yes. So if we're looking for the evidence to tell us that there is an interest level, it's most definitely there. And as Paul said, um, we're hearing over and over again that there is uh, an increased sense of urgency and need to just get on these rather quickly because things are still a little bit unsettled at the current time. And that takes us right into um, reason number four, which is the engagement and employee experience, which is, I think, I have to be honest, one of my favorite topics, which Paul and I have discussed at length in, in recent weeks, right, Paul? Yeah, absolutely. It's definitely a hot topic at the moment and something that's going to become increasingly important as time goes by. 
Yes, absolutely. And we've got some cool things that we're going to show you later on with, with respect to that. Um, Just Burtson noted in, um, in, a, in a piece that he wrote entitled The Employee Experience Platform Market Has Arrived, employee experience solutions go far beyond the traditional functions performed by HR. In fact, almost all employee journeys across HR, IT, and other organizational areas. So that brings up an interesting concept that I'm sure many have heard of, but perhaps some have not, and that's the concept of employee journeys. In the past, we may have heard about customer journeys and what those mean, but now there's an increasing attention focusing on employee journeys. So if we think, okay, well, what is an employee journey? Let's think about, so if we look at our organization, we may have different groups of employees. We may have salaried employees, maybe hourly, management, superintendents, supervisors, maybe contractors. So if we look at all these different groups of employees, they may have slightly different needs for information, uh, for approval processes, and so forth. So let's, for example, take um, an example of an employee journey. Let's call it the family change journey. So maybe this is something to do, an employee has just had a child. What are all of the elements actions and and maybe forms documents that are needed to process this change so if we walk through this example of having a child maybe the first thing they need is the employee would like to review the parental leave policy how much time am i allowed to take time how much time am i allowed to take off then they might say okay now that i know that i'm going to request some personal time off um, they might need to then advise the company of the new dependent the new child so they could be added to benefits or insurance programs um, maybe they've moved to a home at the same time and they need to provide the company with the new address and contact information. So all of these different actions that in the past may have been somewhat separate can now be combined into what we may want to call a family change journey. So instead of having to look for information in different places, Paul, we now have the ability to take these relevant policies, attach them to the workflow, support the time off request action, um, once they've submitted their data changes, we can have an update back into their employee profile and have a HR all within one process. Yeah, absolutely. Like we've seen a big uptake in interest in, in exactly this, this employee experience area where, you know, the, uh, the, the, you need to make that process as seamless as possible for, for your employees because that's the level they're expecting now. You know, now that companies are starting to do this on a broader, wider scale, um, people are just expecting this to be easy. They're expecting, it, they're expecting to have a, a digital system that, that will just tell them what to do, but they can quickly fill in some details, press go, and then automatically their requests and so on are being passed to relevant people and automatically updated in the systems. It's becoming almost the norm. Um, and the whole um, current situation is kind of uh, accelerating all of that. So yeah, absolutely, I just said we've certainly seen a big uptake in this expo employee experience area and how digital processes can, can assist with that. Um, yeah, it's almost like, um, it's almost like em employees are expecting a consumer grade experience. They're, they're looking yep. for um, this idea of a one-stop shop. Okay, if I need to do something, Give me everything I need to do in one nice package so I don't have to go to all these different places. And the same can be true of managers as well. So let's say a manager maybe has to is interested in promoting an employee. Well, typically there's a whole bunch of steps that might need to go along with that. They may need to look at the employee's salary information, maybe their job grade or job band information, so they can assess and decide what maybe the new salary might be. Um, they may need uh, a number of people to approve that promotion, maybe yeah. senior level management, maybe HR needs to review and assess the salary or promotion details. Um, maybe once it's all approved, uh, maybe then they'd like to generate a letter to send to the employee to say, hey, congratulations on your new position. Um, and then maybe there's a whole bunch of other stakeholders that need to be advised. Maybe they need to let um, IT know, for example, because maybe the um, employee needs access to new level of systems or uh, the new salary level needs to get sent to payroll. And then uh, maybe this promotion process as an example, maybe it's different in different countries and different regions. Maybe it's not a standardized process, but it's a, um, it's a process that differs slightly. So Paul, in this example, we can give managers live data from their employee profile right within the process. They can look at the salary information, the job band information, put in their proposed changes, 
workflow it off to the next people to approve it, even generate a letter right from within the process, which I think is, is super cool. And then you can have sub steps, as I understand it, right within the process to notify those other stakeholders like IT and um, yeah. maybe security or, or different people like that. Absolutely, uh, and those processes are becoming a little more complex, um, you know, uh, as the workforce changes. So, one, one of the things that you mentioned earlier on, just sent a, uh, just came back to me. That is, you talked about management of contractors. In fact. So Forma has been used a lot to manage contract workforces because, of course, the turnover of contractors is much higher than the permanent staff. Uh, and, and these processes have to be repeated again and again and again very frequently. Um, so that's somewhere that, uh, you know, where a, a contractor is very sensitive to any, uh, how easy it is to work for you, basically. You know, if you're a contractor, you want to work for an easy employer. Uh, and having uh, like onboarding sorted out so that a person is quickly given the uh, IT access that they need uh, and the IT equipment they need, for example. Little things like that can make a big difference to a, a contractor workforce who, who's, you know, temporary, temporary people moving between employers. You want to keep those uh, contractors happy and get them to do the job and, you know, have them exit the, the company as well uh, quickly and easily. Absolutely. So, yeah, helps with continuity. Yep. Absolutely, Paul. Great, great, great ideas. And, and the next um, slide, um, if, if we move to it, if you wouldn't mind, Connor, this is where um, we've sort of put together um, just some ideas. So if, if we were to think about the, the, um, the very lowest um, um, level on this particular slide, the functional areas. So employees might typically have touch points with HR, maybe with finance, with payroll. Uh, maybe they need to submit travel requests, not right now, but maybe next year, hopefully, fingers crossed. Um, maybe they need uh, new IT access, security, and so forth. So there's a lot of different functional areas this touches on. And the wonderful thing about this um, employee journey is it can bring all of those different functional areas into one cohesive um, employee experience. And then if we look at the very top of the slide, you'll see just some sample employee journeys. Maybe they need some new equipment. Uh, maybe they're relocating or moving, as we talked about the family change, promotion, different things like this. So we take a look and we say, okay, there's all these different functional areas with touch points. There's these different needs that the employees may have, these different journeys. And then we bundle them together in the middle and we say, okay, so we need to pull in data from their employee profile. We need to give them immediate access to maybe certain employee policies. We need to give them forms and documents, help them work through the workflow and approval processes. And then when all of it's completed, go back and update their data. And that's really what we're going to show you today, how this can actually be done in a very cohesive and streamlined manner. Um, Paul, um, I, I think also one of the things we were talking about um, just before I forget is not only can we um, manage these employee journeys, but we can also measure what the impact and, and the satisfaction rate of these employee journeys are. And that leads to the other um, portion of this particular point, and that's employee engagement. So um, one of the really cool things we can do is we can do pulse surveys, um, NPS or net promoter score um, surveys, or even longer surveys such as exit surveys or satisfaction surveys. But particularly with the quick pulse and NPS surveys, we can immediately have a feedback loop on these journeys to ask employees, okay, well, you've just submitted a family change uh, uh, a request. How did that go? Was it smooth for you? Is there anything you would recommend? Any way we could improve it? And we can get that immediate feedback loop going so that we can iterate and continuously improve. And that really supports agility and supports our business resilience because we're really in touch and we have our finger on the pulse of what's, what's working and what's not working with our uh, employee community. And Paul, I think you're going to be walking us through some examples of some pulse surveys and, and other uh, processes like that. Yeah, absolutely. I'll show you what a pulse survey uh, looks like. And uh, one of the key things about it, of course, is that it's anonymous so that, uh, you know, those employees can actually be, say, uh, be comfortable with uh, supplying information that they might otherwise not be uh, like happy their boss know, knowing of the details and so on, that can be covered off in their anonymous forms feature. So I'll show let you that later. Yeah, the extensive capability of surveys is really exciting. All different types of surveys and just engagement um, tools that can be used. And, and um, if we jump over into our fifth reason, business continuity, there's some really interesting things we can do here as well. Um, as McKinsey stated, we've not seen the end of this crisis. I, I think we know that, unfortunately. Um, nor do we know exactly when the recovery will come, but it will come. 
and the CEOs who can best prepare their businesses effectively for a more digital future will give their companies the best chance for a brighter future. Um, Paul, you've created some extensive business continuity processes which can be modified and adapted uh, for on a country basis to incorporate local regulations and requirements. And I think you'll be walking us through an example as well. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. Yeah. Um, and continuity plans are, um, you know, they have to be set and they have to be reset, you know, as time goes by and circumstances change and so on. I'll cover that off in our demonstration. Looking forward to that. Um, because you know what, some some um, some of the analysts that um, that I've read, some are some are split on the idea, but um, a number of them believe that what we've seen this year could be categorized as a black swan event. Um, for anyone not familiar with the black swan event, that's typically defined as an unpredictable event that is normally that is beyond what is normally expected, and which has potentially severe consequences. Um, and in particular, in an article um, entitled Responding to COVID-19, 10 Lessons from the World's HR Leaders, um, Josh Bernson notes, I do believe, by the way, that black swan events are here to stay. And as terrible as this one is, we have to recognize that this may be our new normal. So when we look at our situation in light of that, I think it becomes increasingly apparent that business continuity planning is vital. And it also needs to be flexible which is why it's important to have it in an agile tool, because we need to plan for unpredictable, possibly black swan events, and we need to be able to uh, adapt and be agile, because at the end of the day, we have to be able to respond to um, crisis. And if our programs and processes are agile and designed for resiliency, that's only going to put us in a better position. It will allow us to respond both globally and locally. So if we just jump over to the next slide, please, Connor. Um, so this was a, a quote that I found particularly um, um, of interest. Uh, Mackenzie stated that a digital future lies ahead. By acting early and being bold and decisive, CEOs can accelerate their digital transformation and reach the next normal sooner. So if we if we pull together all of the ideas that we've discussed today. What if we could automate and integrate our global HR processes while still supporting the needs of our local constituents? Um, what if a vendor could work with you to define processes that you need and help you build them? And what if the system was agile, configurable, and adaptable so that it could meet the needs not only today, but as your needs change and evolve over time? Um, we would now like to take you on just a, a brief tour, if you don't mind, of just some of the processes and, and areas that we've discussed today, just to sort of bring it all into um, sharper focus. Um, if we just jump to the next slide, Connor, I think that that is the um, demo slide. Yeah, so just before oh, we jump into well, a very yeah, yeah, just before we jump into a very brief uh, yeah. demonstration, I think we're a little bit behind time, but we might just squeeze in this second poll. Um, so uh, this this poll uh, I'm going to pop up on your screen now in a moment. Um, so we're asking historically what has been the main in inhibitor in preventing your digital advancements, and we're going to put up um, uh, the poll here and. We'd encourage you by all means to um, select multiple uh, if you wish. Um, so that should be up on your screens now. Um, so as I said, uh, historically, what has been the main inhibitor in preventing your digital advancements? So um, as I said, select multiple if you wish. Um, so the options are budget, lack of time and resources, lack of knowledge on the benefits and other. Um, so I might just give you another five or 10 seconds on that just to log your answers because uh, I'm just conscious we're a little bit uh, tight for time today, um, but as uh, Jacinta has gone through, I think those are five very compelling reasons. So um, I might just give you uh, five, four, three, two, one, and I'll close that poll for you. Um, and thank you for submitting your answers uh, as well. So I might just uh, pop over here onto the next slide. I believe Jacinta, you're going to just uh, run through. Um, briefly about Hubbub, and then I think Paul is going to take us through a little bit of uh, flow form and process automation. So, Okay, perfect. So just very briefly, um, just wanted to show you a little bit about what Hubbub HR looks like. So this would just be an example of um, a, a homepage or a dashboard page where you can incorporate 
uh, different elements, different types of requests, different reminders, just really some employee friendly uh, type information. And just to jump over to another example, this would be an example, um, oh, I just need to size my screen there, but this would be an example of just some immediate insights that would be available to you uh, for the different modules that are in um, Hubbub HR and different links and things that you can have, again, to support that one-stop shop uh, type of approach. And as mentioned at the very top of the um, session today, uh, we have modules for HRS. Uh, performance, compensation planning, compliance, um, disciplinary actions, grievances, things like that, uh, learning and succession. And again, the system is designed to be highly configurable to meet um, needs across your organization. And even right within the system, um, you've got the ability to create um, some really nice looking org charts, which you can modify, um, you can include different fields on, you can start at different levels in the organization. Uh, but for the purpose of today's webinar, the piece that we'd like to show you is um, how you can jump right into the processes. And Paul's going to walk you through these in some of these in just a moment. But as you can see, there are so many different types of processes that can be supported. Everything from pulse surveys to um, different types of start and, and leave forms, um, exit surveys, uh, new hire processes, change requests, and so forth. So now I'm going to hand it over to Paul. And I believe that, Paul, you're going to walk us through um, a couple examples. Yep, absolutely. So um, what I'm going to do is, uh, what you sent to showed you there was the business user portal. Um, so it's the business user portal that, uh, uh, sorry, can I just confirm you can see my screen? Yes. Okay, great. So what uh, Jacinta was showing you was the business user portal. So that's like your HR user. Um, and we have a configuration portal as well, which I'm in right now. And what I've done is I've opened up a brand new uh, pre-return to work process. Now the pre-return to work process uh, shows you all the steps that are in the process. So here we have the induction and uh, return to work safety, HR review, pre-return details and so on. And all these steps must be executed before you achieve your business goal, which is the return to work. This process is normally initiated by HR and actually completed by the employee before they arrive back in the office. Um, and they have to go through a series of approvals, reviews, and um, to have their details validated and so on. Um, as an employee moves through the process, um, what you'll see is the process progressing from one step to the next. All of these steps can be assigned to different resources in the organization, so the appropriate person always carries out the work. And the system automatically builds an audit trail of all of this in the background, so all the activity is tracked so that you can see at any one point in time where the process is, whether it's a process that you launched or whether it's a process that's just assigned to you right now, because you're completing one of the steps in the process, you can see the status of everything. And you can see that right back on that business dashboard that, uh, that Jacinta just showed you. Um, if we look at this process, what we can see is that we can see our steps, but below that, we can see some data fields. Now, what the system does is it integrates into Hubbub and pulls out information uh, related to the current user um, and employee record and so on, and passes that information into an electronic form and this form uh, here that we're looking at relates to the current step, which is the induction step. So we have some instructions here and so on, and I can uh, then fill in the, the fields. So I can say, okay, well, I want to, uh, you know, I'm based in Canada, my induction is completed. Yes, it is. And when I say yes, the form is dynamic, so it automatically pops up additional information that may need to be captured. So the system is, is looking at all the details that you're entering and validating that information and acting on it. Um, so in this case, it's saying, yes, I've completed induction, great. What date did you complete it on? I'm gonna say the 30th of, of the 11th. So what is your address? I could type, gonna type in one long street. And when I've done that, I've completed all the details on my steps, so I can press the submit button down here and the workflow automatically moves it on to the next stage in the process, which could be assigned to me or could be assigned to a different person altogether in the organization. Now, for the purposes of demonstration, I've assigned a whole lot to me so I can get through my processes and do the demo. Um, but normally, as I say, these steps will be assigned to different people and you can send email notifications to those people with links in the email and you click on the link and it brings you back into the process and you fill in your part of the form. And now we moved on to the second step here and you can see all the data has changed. And that's because in this particular step, we've got to do a, a safety protocol checklist. So we've got to go through each one of these. Are you aware of the signs and symptoms of COVID-19? And I have to answer appropriate, appropriately to that question and fill in all the various answers to all the questions here. At the very end of this particular step, if I scroll down, what we'll see is that um, I've got to also 
Um, if I've answered no to any questions, I have to provide a reason why. It automatically tracks who I am, who's the logged in user. And then down here as well, I'm able to um, put in the signature um, and save that. And that signature can then be output in a, a document, let's say a contract document or a confirmation document. And that document can be attached to an email and sent on to, to uh, a person within the organization or outside, outside the organization. Um, so there's a wide range of types of data that's captured on different steps in the process. Now, just so you know, um, you might be thinking, well, hang on a second, what about all that induction information? Where it's gone? Where has it gone? It's disappeared. Not at all. It's actually back on the induction step, and you can click on any step in the process by default and view the information that was keyed in at that point in time. Um, now, that point, that detail was keyed in maybe, maybe by a different person at a different stage in the process, so you can see it as read-only information, and it's tracked in a log uh, as the process continues on. So you get a complete set of data and documentation that relate to this particular instance of a process, this particular pre-return to work process. Um, and that's it. So you, you move on and then ultimately um, the work is completed and you have a complete all the trail, all the trail of, the, of the process that you're working on. And all of that is saved in, uh, in the background system. Uh, it's saved in Hubbub. You also have the documentation saved in SharePoint. Um, so all the information is kind of tied together and related to each other. Now that's what a typical process looks like, in this case pre-return to work. What I'm going to do now is just jump over to another uh, browser where I'm not logged in. So normally Flowforma requires you to be logged in to carry out a process. It, it requires, it actually tracks an audit, so it keeps an audit trail, so it requires you to be uh, what's known as authenticated. Um, but you can actually create a form where you can, you're basically completing a form as an anonymous user. So you can be sent a link, for example, in an email, click on that link, um, and then what happens is you don't need to be logged in at all, uh, and the system will automatically uh, present you with a form. So here's an example of the uh, Net Promoter Score forms that uh, Simpson was talking about earlier on, where basically you're asking a simple question about employee satisfa satisfaction, you're sending them a link, as you can see, it's a complicated anonymous link here. And when they click on that link in the email, it automatically opens up that form and they can then specify what level of satisfaction they have with the company. They can put in some comments. They could put in a full set of detail here. I mean, you're not limited to one or two fields. You can put in a hundred fields if needed um, and feed that back into the system. And then that is ultimately saved. Uh, and then you can use that for analytic reporting. So the whole idea here is that, you know, you can send out these links to people um, and they can fill that data in anonymously and then it can be stored in your central database and you can carry out analytics on it. Um, so you can carry out a wide range of surveys and all the surveys can be linked together so that as you complete one survey, a following survey can be scheduled for a week later and then a week after that, a week after that and so on. Uh, gradually asking people uh, questions that uh, helps determine people's mood. Um, so you're, you're gauging employee satisfaction in the, uh, in, the, in the workplace. The next one I'd like to quickly show you is business continuity. Now business continuity is a relatively complex process where you're setting up a business continuity plan. And the plan involves many different steps. Uh, as you can see straight away, just the instructions here on, on what to do are, are quite a lot more complex than the pre-return to work we, shot, we saw earlier on. And, and as you submit this information, it, uh, it moves on to a set of steps that are carried out in parallel within the organization when involves involves setting up a continuity plan. So if I open up that continuity plan I just created, what we'll see here is that we've got several steps that are, each one of them is quite complex because they set out a series of tasks, a checklist if you like, and um, which has to be responded to. And while the planning activities might be assigned to myself, we have different tasks here that are assigned to different people in the organization and they're all completed in parallel. So what this is like allowing you to do is execute a much more complex process, a program of work to define a continuity plan. And what we're seeing here are the tasks in that. So for example, attain information on COVID-19, what's the current status of that? Oh, that's completed. I can then upload a document to evidence that and I can indicate the date that, I, that it was completed and work down through this list until finally um, I can say the planning activities checklist for this particular section is complete. And then it will ask me to um, confirm and sign uh, with my signature and I will stamp it automatically with a date added to the audit trail, et cetera. So it really allows you to do uh, very complex um, processes that are actually more like programs um, and then you know, execute those programs to completion. Now, all of the processes that I showed you are very easy to configure. 
uh, we have a thing called a no-code configuration tool that lets you uh, build out your processes and modify those processes very easily over time. And um, so if I jump over to my other window here, it shows you the pre-return to work process that I showed you earlier on. And this is our no-code configuration tool. Here we can see all the steps in the process and inside the steps we can see some data items and we also have these things called business rules that do things like send emails and so on, it's email notifications at various points in the process. Uh, it's very easy to use and it doesn't require any sp specific IT skills. So for example, if I wanted to add a step into this process, a brand new task that had to be completed, I just type in um, the, the new step, uh, whatever the title is, uh, let's actually put in a real title here, HR approval. Uh, um, and then basically when I add in this step, I fill in the form, it automatically adds a step into the end of the workflow and I can drag it up to the appropriate execution point. And then inside that step, I might want to ask a few questions and get people to fill in some details. So I'm going to add in a question here that says, do you approve? Um, and then what will happen is this question will appear on the screen when uh, the workflow gets to that step. And I can capture a wider range of different types of detail and of course add in many different fields into the, into the form here. And it automatically then will request, will request that piece of information when, when, that, when the person arrives in that step. I can also dynamically assign the steps in the workflow and so on. There's a lot, an awful lot you can do uh, with Flowforma. So uh, just simply mentioned the ability to generate documents, uh, again, using a no-code interface. You can also send emails, email communications. You can capture a wider range of data. You can push and pull information out of uh, the Hubbub database. Um, and all of this can be done using a really no-code interface that's, that's very easy to use. Um, there's approximately a two-day training cycle on, on this product to be able to configure um, large complex workflows yourselves. Um, straight away when I save that and I go back in and launch that process again, what we'll see now is that that process uh, looks a little different. It's got that additional step in it, so pre-return to work. Um, so straight away you can see the impact of the changes that you're making um, and then you can go and test those out and you can pass out the links uh, and so on to, to, to other people to, to evaluate your changes and give you feedback on them and so on. So it's a very dynamic agile system where it's very easy to change things and you can respond to changes in your business environment. Okay, with that, uh, one last thing just to say that we also have a mobile interface. So when you look at uh, uh, the the system via your mobile phone, for example, you see a very similar interface with the workflow and all the details, uh, all modified to work in a, in a touch sensitive screen. And that's also compatible with Apple and Android devices. And with that, I know we're pushed for time, so I'm gonna pass you back now to uh, Jacinta. Thank you, Paul. That was that was a fantastic overview. It's so interesting to see everything from the uh, simpler processes like NPS pulse surveys with maybe just one question right through to um, more HR related just sort of uh, administrative processes and right through to the more complex business continuity. So all of those different types of um, of, of processes can be supported, updating the data, pulling in the data, basically giving everything that the user community would need on a just-in-time basis. Um, really, the possibilities are, are quite endless, so um, it, it's an exciting note to end on. And just as we end, if we could just go to the final slide, please, um, Connor. Um, I think this is probably my favorite quote, so I sort of kept it for last. Um, this is by Jason Aberbrook. Um, in an article that he wrote earlier this year, Time to Unlearn the Old Ways of Doing HR. And I think this is kind of encouraging. Um, even though it may be a difficult time right now, I, I think this gives us cause for encouragement. He says, I truly think this is a magical time for HR. It is a time to step on the accelerator and to leave behind past practices that we know don't work. And on that note, I'd like to thank everybody for their time and I'd like to pass you over to Connor. Thanks very much, Jacinta. Uh, some great insight there from both Jacinta and Paul, and thanks very much. Um, so uh, I, we're running a bit behind time, unfortunately, but uh, as the guys have discussed, I think uh, I think everyone knows now that is, uh, now is the time um, to think forward and embrace uh, the power of HR digital transformation. Um, we've got a Q&A session. We're very, very, very much gone over time, but there was a lot of questions came in, so I'm just gonna rattle off just a couple. Um, 
So there's one here um, that's asking, I know I need to move to a digital HR, but I don't know where to start. Is that something that maybe just into you could uh, you could help with or just be able to guide this person? Yeah, absolutely happy to. Thanks, Connor. Uh, yes, you know what? The place to start is just where you're at, wherever you're at right now. So if you have data and it's sitting in spreadsheets or you have data and it's in another system that is no longer serving your needs, we can start with that. We can start with looking at what do your stakeholders need, what processes, what, what programs do you need to support. And we generally recommend start with what you need right now and then continue to evolve over time. You don't need to have all of the answers to start on this journey. It's just a matter of getting started. Great. Thanks, Jacinta. Um, I might just get one more in before we go. Um, there's one here, Paul, um, asking, can I as a HR person build my own workflows or do I need to involve IT? Yeah, absolutely. You can you can build your own workflows. Um, the system is designed really as a no code uh, solution. What that means simply is that you don't have to be an IT person to to understand how to use it. I think I showed there uh, how easy it was to add in a step, for example. But it's just as easy to create a, your own brand new workflow for by yourselves. Um, and ourselves and Hobo really support you in doing that. So. Yeah, absolutely. As a HR person, you don't need uh, specific technical skills. You can you can go in and modify the workflows and create workflows that fit your specific environment. Great. Thanks, Paul. Um, I think that's all we have time for, unfortunately. Um, but thanks for submitting your questions. Um, and I'm sure our panel will get to them today. Um, so thank you for those. Um, finally, then, I just want to say uh, thanks, everyone, for uh, watching and participating in our q and I know we didn't get to those questions, but uh, thanks for submitting them and for your poll uh, submissions as well. Um, and thanks again to Paul and Jacinta for your insights today. I appreciate it very much. Uh, it's a busy time at the minute, so thank you very much. Um, and very finally, if you want to reach out uh, to Hobo HR or Flowformer for a one-to-one -one demo um, to help you digitize and streamline your HR processes, uh, I suggest you do so. Um, and there's five compelling reasons as to why you should do that. Um, and alternatively, uh, you can arrange a one-to-one -one call uh, with either of the panel today uh, for a more in-depth discussion. But uh, Thank you very much. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, a very short survey will appear once the broadcast uh, is finished. Um, if you could just take 30 seconds to fill it out, it'd be, it's really, they're invaluable for us um, to find out um, the challenges that you're facing and what is it you want to hear. So um, if you could fill that out, that'd be great. Uh, thanks very much again for attending today and thanks to the panel and we'll see you in, on our next webinar. Thank you.